Good to be in the house of the Lord together again, isn't it? And we, we had a good time this morning. I'm looking for a good time tonight. Thank the Lord for all those that came this morning. A lot of them's not here. We don't know where they are and, and what's happening. Let's remember them in our prayers this evening, that God will be with them and help them. But praise God that we have the freedom to come together again on the Lord's Day, a beautiful day that he has given us. Now, I want to start out with prayer. And also, also, you can give your praise reports. We love to hear them, and I know God does. So I'm going to start on my left. Anybody? Yes, let's remember him, and we know God can take care of that. Yes. Anybody else on that side? How about this section here? Anybody? Sister? Yes. Amen. Yes. And we know the Lord's able. Yes. Anybody in this section, brother? Yes. Amen. Anybody else before we move? Extreme right, anybody? Sam. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Pastor. Amen. Yes. Anybody else, just in case you remembered something you want to say? Okay, would you stand, please? And we know our God is able. He heard all these prayer requests. Yes. And I like it where Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. So we must believe. So let's believe when we call on his name. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you again on this lovely Lord's Day in the name of Jesus. Thanking you, Lord, for the privilege to gather together in his name. Thank you for every person that's here. Thank you for every blessing you've blessed us with. And, oh, God, we just praise that you, pray that you'll be here in a mighty way that we can praise you from the depths of our hearts. And may our praise go up, oh, God, and may you receive it. And, oh, God, may you be pleased with this mode of worship that we have tonight, that you'll bless every man, woman, boy, and girl that's here. Pray, bless and anoint our praise and worship team as they... Do what you've called them to do and bless our pastors he, or, or Brother Gene when he brings the word tonight. And we thank you for Brother Gene stepping up, oh God, when called upon. And we thank you for everyone, all the leaders in the church, Lord. We pray for a rich blessing upon each and every one. 
and we ask that you continue to keep your hands upon us and continue to give us all traveling mercies and continue to save our people. Lord, we have a lot of lost loved ones. We pray that you'll bring them in just like Sister Samantha's sister. Lord, we pray that you'll bring her into the fold before it's too late. And Lord, we pray that you'll take care of all of these, our pastor's mother, Lord, that you'll lift her up and, and help her through all that she's going through. Lord God, we're looking for positive results. We thank you for Sister Kathy Gaskins being here tonight. And as well as she is, we praise you for that. We thank you for all blessings. And we put all these pr prayer requests in your hands. And we ask that you'll take care of them in your way and in your time. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's nothing too hard for you. And bless this service tonight. And bless every man, woman, boy, and girl abundantly. And return, may we worship you and praise you from the depths of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Good evening. Who's glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. We're going to speak a little life tonight. I am the righteousness of God. I stand in covenant with Him. And through this, I have new life, new anointing, and new power. I will not worry, nor have fear. Lord, your word and your spirit, they come for me. I am increasing in your knowledge and in your wisdom. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Through your covenant, I am healthy. I am blessed. There's nothing missing, nothing broken. You have made me a blessing, and everything I touch is blessed. Lord, I thank you that my family walks in obedience to your word and to your will. Take me, Lord. Take Ridgeville Church of God to the highest place in glory. Amen. Will you give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight? Lord, we just thank you, God. We worship you, Lord, and we give you praise and honor tonight, Lord. We just thank you, God, that we can come and we can glorify your name. God, we welcome you and Holy Spirit into this service tonight, God, and we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory son and daughter the king of glory the king above all kings who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun and all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings
conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. Amen. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for. Can you just thank the Lord for what he's done for you? Lord, we just thank you, God, for saving us, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, God. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you picked me up, God, and you turned me around, Lord. God, we just thank you for your grace tonight. Amen. Of his holy name, sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song. Your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy
scripture for our offertory. While you're turning, let me make some quick announcements. Don't forget, men, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock is the men's meeting. Come, be a part of that. Uh, this year is quickly passing. It's hard to believe this year is almost over. And so listen, Friday night we have the conclusion of our revival service that Hurricane thought he could pause, but God's in ultimate control, and so we're excited about having that. And the next Sunday is obviously our casual Sunday, but we get an opportunity to serve the community. And as Brother Gene made mention during the meeting, Ridgeville always goes above and beyond. We show them love, we show them appreciation, and I know it's discouraging sometimes. When you, you put that event on and you hope that somehow, some way, you'll pick up a family here and there. But listen, we don't know the seeds that have been planted. And some things take a little bit longer to grow, but when it grows, the roots are strong. And that's what we're expecting. We're expecting seeds to be planted. And maybe they come last year, and guess what? This year, we're going to do some watering. But in God's time, the seed always comes forth. Amen. And so, listen, there's sign-up sheets out there in the foyer. If you haven't brought your candy, bring some candy. If you haven't signed up to bring something, there's always something. There's also the sign-up sheet for our church appreciation dinner. And so I want you to put your name down. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, I know we have some new faces from this time last year. And it's just a place that we get to honor you. I can't pay everybody for all that they do here at the church. And so every year the church feeds, buy some gifts, and we're going to have a, a fun time as always, but put your name down. There's no cost to you. Uh, it'll start at five instead of six on our normal, but that's on December the 18th. And so, Sister Darlene, will you do me a favor? Will you put your name down? You're a part of us, and I want you there. We want to love on you. It's going to be a challenging season but you're not forgotten. I honked my horn at you when I was coming, and I thought about you and said a prayer. And this passage hits a situation like that as it does everything. Listen, come to me. All ye who labor and are heavy laden, I'm going to give you rest. I could hear my mama's voice this morning when she said, son, it's been seven years. And seven years is a long time that she's had to sit in an empty house. Roles reversed itself as a, as a mother. You nourish your child up to an age and then they go on their own and the passing of my father, my brother, come and became the caretaker of my mama. Day in and day out, he cared to her needs. Tragically, his life was cut short. There's still markers on the wall where he would beat it after he had his stroke. That's his, that's his bell. And mama would go and become mom to son again, being his caretaker, feeding him and all the things that a bedridden person needs. And I don't know how long it's been that you feel like maybe God's forgotten you, but he's not. He's here. He's ready to, to take that yoke. Look at verse 29. I didn't get to it this, this morning, but take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle lowly and hard and you will find rest for your soul and we know verse 30 that just simply says 
for my yoke is easy. And so I want you to grab your offering and we're going to pray. Now while we pray, we're going to lift up the needs of the house. But we're going to pray for Brother Gene too because he'll be the one bringing the word today. So Father, thank you for caring enough for us to establish in your word that I want to give you rest. I want to make your burdens light. I want to bring some peace to your situation. It's not beneficial for you to worry. I'm here to take your fear. I'm here to take your concerns. The things that have gripped you and held you back from moving closer to me, I'm ready to take it. I want to do a work in your life. As we learned this morning, there's a table spread before us in the presence of our enemy. So God, whatever our enemy's name is, will you help us to find peace in it, rest in it, as we are in the presence of God. Bless the offering. Minister unto it. And help us, Lord, and I pray a special anointing over the servant of the hour. A word that you have birthed in him long before the announcement of him speaking. Only validates that there's something that has to come forth. And so, Lord, we pray that we're receptive in our ears and in our hearts. That we can do according to your will. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Remain standing as our ushers serve you tonight.
about the president depending who's in, who, on who's in the office you might not want to sing to them or you may we're not singing about the kings and the queens of the earth we're singing about our savior and I don't know what picture you have in your mind of who Jesus is But one of the things that we heard over and over and over again this week when we were at at, uh, Ruach, we're not serving a Jesus that's still hanging on a cross. He's not still hanging on a cross. He's not still in the tomb. He's alive. He's risen. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, it says that Jesus, being in the form of God, he considered it not robbery to be equal with him, But even in that, he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of man, the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. But it didn't stop there. It said, therefore God has highly exalted him and he has given him a name which is above every name. That name Jesus. And it says at that name, that name Jesus, that every knee one day will bow. Scripture actually says shall bow. And when it it issues that word shall, it is a commandment. It's not going to be a choice of anybody's. It's not going to be a choice of any persons or any things. They're going to bow whether they like it or not. Every knee will bow. Of those that are in heaven, those that are on earth, and those beneath the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Scripture tells us that, that, that the disciple John was close enough to Jesus that he rested himself on the bosom, on the chest of Jesus. But when he seen him again in the visions on the Isle of Patmos, the Bible says he did not recognize him in his glory and he laid almost as a dead man before Jesus. 
The vision of Jesus was so powerful that one day on earth, he was so close to him that he rested his head on his bosom. But the next time he seen him in his glory, in his power, and he fell down like a dead man before him. Who do you serve? Do you still serve that Jesus that was hanging on the cross? That's a beautiful story. And he did that for us. Are you serving the Jesus who is risen, who is now sitting, sitting on the right hand of the Father, praying for you, praying for me? That Revelation says that his eyes are like fire, his feet are like brass, his hair is like pure wool. And his voice is this many waters. Who are you serving tonight? I'm going to tell you, these guys behind me tonight set me up. I asked them to sing the song, I Will Make Room. They had absolutely no idea what I was preaching. Most of the time I tell people I don't have an idea what I'm preaching until I get behind the pulpit sometimes. This time I knew. God began to speak to me several months ago before the pastor even asked me about speaking. As a matter of fact, the Friday that mama had her surgery, the pastor asked me about speaking. And I had already made up in my mind Thursday that the next time I got with the pastor, I was going to ask him, when can I have another turn to speak? But I didn't feel like it was the right time at mama's surgery that day. And he called me instead. And I said, it's got to be God. And I know y'all can't see it, but tonight I am nervous to be standing here. And I'm generally nervous. And I remember an old preacher that I, growing up, some of you may know him, Pastor Bruce Fox. He used to say, the minute that you can get behind this desk and not be nervous, he says, the best thing for you to do is fold up everything and have a seat. But tonight, I don't know how this is going to go. Because this that God has given me has just shaken me in the, to the core. And I'm asking him to give me the ability to speak it as he gave it to me. And I'm not going to be before us long tonight. And I don't want the praise team to go anywhere for the moment. I'm just trying to hear him. But I believe that God is trying to do something in his church. I believe God is trying to do something in his people. And the title of my message tonight is simply, I will make room for you. And I'm taking my scripture tonight from the book of John. We're going to be in the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 8. It's a very familiar passage of scripture. But the Bible says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead whom he had raised from the dead. And there they made him supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And the Bible says, But then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who is the one that betrayed him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money and had the money box and he used it to take what was put in it. 
But Jesus said, let her alone. Leave her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always. But me you do not have always. Luke chapter 7 verses 36 through 50 tells the same story in a little bit different way. That does not mean that scripture contradicts itself whatsoever. As a matter of fact, one thing I spoke to my teens about a couple weeks ago, investigators, police investigators will tell you if you have five people that can tell you the same story exactly the same way, they're lying. If you have five people that see the same thing happen, they will tell you a similar story, but they will not be able to tell you exactly the same thing. Why? Because we don't all think alike. And so we're going to tell it from our vision, what we perceived it as. The scripture is the same way. You've got four different men writing scripture in the Gospels. All four of them tell the same story in a little bit different version, but they all line up. But Luke records it in the way that she came. She anointed him. And she washed his feet with her tears. And then she dried them with her hair. That will be important in just a little bit as I get into this. Tonight, my question that I pose before the church is, will you make room for Jesus? Or will we continue to be full of what we're full of? that's keeping him from moving in our life like he truly wants to. Y'all pray with me tonight. Our Heavenly Father, God, I do thank you for this opportunity. God, to stand before your people and declare the word that you have given me. Father, I pray that your anointing would be upon me, God. That I could speak and deliver in the way that you see fit, God. Father, I pray right now that every one of us in here tonight would take a moment and God, that we would search ourselves and that we would break up all or any fallow ground that might be within our hearts and our lives, God. That we would receive the fresh seed of this word tonight, God. That it could bloom into just what you're trying to do in your people in this last hour, God. Father, I thank you and I praise you for all that you have done. And I'm thanking you in advance, God, tonight for all that you are going to do. For it is in your son's precious name I do pray. Amen and amen. If you guys will just hang tight with me. Because we're going to come back to that song in just a little bit. I'm not going to be long tonight. I'm going to do my best to, to speak what I have to speak. And then I'm going to get out of God's way because I believe if we will allow him, God is trying to do something in his church and in his people. But sometimes, y'all, we are too full of stuff that we just can't let him move us or he just can't move us in the way that he's trying whether it be the weight of life whether it be the the weight of sin whether it be the weight of, of grief it, it doesn't matter what it is the question i can't answer that question for all of us we have to search our own self out and ask god sometimes what is it what is the weight in me that keeps me from moving in your favor? What is it that keeps me from walking in your anointing? What is it that keeps me from feeling your presence and feeling your power when I don't? And I understand there are times in life that God is just quiet and he's quiet for a reason. The best way that I know to describe it is like I've heard it before. It says when you're having a test at school, the teacher is always there. But it's during that time that the teacher is silent. Because they've done all the educating, they've done all the teaching, they've done all the remedial stuff that they may have to do. Now it's your time to show them what you've learned. And a test not, is not necessarily to show the teacher what they've learned. But it's really to show you what you've learned. And it's the same way with God. Sometimes... 
he's just quiet through a trial of life because he's taught us all that we need to know to get through that trial. He's given us everything that we need. And he's not just sitting back watching us fumble through life. But there are times that he has to be silent to show us who we are. God has given us everything that we need in Scripture to walk through every avenue of life that we will ever walk through. Not only that, he's gracious enough and loving enough that he'll speak to us when we speak to him. God is always talking. He's always speaking. The issue when we can't hear him sometimes may be that we're just not listening. When is the last time, and I ask, I ask myself this, when is the last time that you just got still and you got quiet and you asked him to speak? And again, that's only a question that we can ask or answer ourselves. But so often, think of the last time you prayed. So many times we get caught up in asking God to do this. And asking God to do that. And, the, and we should ask Him. But when is the last time you just went to God and said, I don't want to ask for a thing. I just want to thank you. The Bible tells us that where the praises of the people are, he will come down in the midst and he will inhabit. It says he inhabits the praises of his people. When you inhabit something, that means you move in. You're not there for a little while. You're not there for a vacation stay. When you inhabit something, you move into it. You live in it. And so in essence, he inhabits our praises. Where there is praise, that's where he lives. So when our prayer life becomes more about what we need him to do for us and there is no praise, can he dwell there? Can he inhabit there? When our life gets so full of, of, of situations and needs that our life becomes more about what I need, more about what I need to do, he can't dwell there. He can't inhabit that. There is no praise there. Friday evening, we had the privilege to hear Bishop Marvin Winan speak. I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard him speak. But he said something that I have never thought of in my life. And he says so many times in every situation that we get in in life, when we can quit looking at the situation and we can understand the intentions of God, nothing will ever be able to defeat us again. When you have somebody, a loved one that gets sick and, and, and passes away because of that sickness, it can very much wreck your life depending on how close you are to them. But when you understand the intentions of God is to prosper you, not to harm you, it's to give you hope, to give you a future. He has a plan for you. It doesn't matter what situation in life you get in. When you know his intentions, you understand that the avenue that he's allowing you to walk down right now is going to lead to something greater something better, something more beautiful. And when you can walk with confidence in Him and you can walk with your head held high knowing that right now times may be hard, but His intentions are to prosper me, not to harm me. His intentions are for me to live saved, not to walk aimlessly. His intentions are for me to one day make it to heaven and live with Him, not to go to hell. There's nothing we can't face in life knowing the intentions of God is to prosper us. That was all free. That's not even part of my message tonight. <laughs> tonight I want to take just a few minutes of your time and speak about making room for Jesus. 
at this very familiar passage of Scripture, we have read this many, many times, I'm sure. I'm sure you've heard it preached many, many times before. I'm sure you've heard it preached in many different ways. And tonight I'm going to take liberty and preach it my way. In accordance to the scripture, of course, but I tell people sometimes you might not like how I say it. And if that's the case, ask the pastor for your turn to speak next week and you can re-preach it. And I'll enjoy it too. But the Bible says that there was a meeting going on and Jesus was sitting at the table and he was eating with, with the men. This was a men's meeting, so to speak. And you have to understand in this day and age that women were very low on the totem pole. They weren't welcome in those meetings. They weren't allowed. Now, Martha was serving, so she was allowed to be there because she was standing in the office that men seemed fit for her to stand, and it was to serve. And that's not what I'm saying that women are good for. Women have power, just like men have power in the church, but that's not my message tonight. What I want us to understand is not where Martha was, but where Mary was. Because Scripture also records in some of the other tellings of this story, it doesn't call her name Mary. It doesn't necessarily tell where they were. It just says a sinful woman bust up in the middle of this men's meeting where she did not belong. And she'd done something that not even the men of that hour did for Jesus himself. It was customary in that day when visitors came into your house, you offered them a bowl of water to wash their feet because they walked around in sandals. They walked around in, in dusty roads. They didn't have highways like we had back then. It was dusty roads, rocky roads. They walked behind animals so you can only imagine what they stepped in along the way at times. They had open-footed sandals that they were walking in, so their feet were dirty. And when they came into your house, it was a custom for you to offer them the ability to wash their feet. And in one version, Jesus even says, leave her alone because she has done what you would not do for me. The Bible says that Mary comes in the middle of this meeting and I don't believe in any way she was disrespectful. I don't believe she made a scene. I don't believe she came in and announced herself. But I believe that she walked in in full humility, just as humble as she could be, knowing who she was, knowing the sin that she had in her life, knowing what everyone around that table thought of her more than likely knowing what the devil whispered in her ear daily of who she was, how she was not fit to do this, how she was not fit to do that. Does it sound familiar? How many times do we walk in the house of God and he tells us to go lay hands on somebody and pray for them or go speak this word to them and the very first thing that begins to resonate in our mind is, I can't do that. I'm not worthy enough to do that. In our relationships with one another, how many times may we be at odds with one another and God begins to deal with our heart to make things right and we begin to say, I wasn't the one who was wrong. So why do I have to? Why does it matter what you did or did not do? Make it right. So that we can get all the odds out of the way because y'all, God is trying to move in his house, in his people. But we are so full of stuff that he can't move. I remember hearing a preacher one time and he spoke on... Um, Jesus, when Jairus, came, or when Jairus sent servants to him to call him to come, he said, my daughter is, is sick and she's dying. Come and pray for her. And the Bible says that on the way to his, to his house, that a, a, the woman with the issue of blood snuck in the crowd. She forced her way through the crowd. She wasn't even supposed to be there. 
Because at that time, the Bible says when, the, when the, the customs of the day, when a woman was going through that time of her life and that time of the month, she was to go outside of the camp. And that's where she stayed until she was cleansed. And the Bible says hers began one day and never stopped. She was not supposed to be amongst the people. She was supposed to be on the outside of the camp where the unclean things were. But yet she heard that Jesus was coming through and she took the punishment of whatever it was going to be on herself because she knew if I can just touch the hem of his garment. He don't have to see me. He don't have to speak to me. He doesn't have to lay his hands on me. He doesn't have to pray over me. He doesn't have to do nothing. But if I can just touch but not even, I don't even have to touch him. I just have to touch his clothes. I know that I'll be made whole. No doubt she was thinking if I can get made whole, I can come back home. I can be amongst people again. I can be around my family again. But in that aspect and what he was preaching is he was preaching about the two different types of people in the church, the older generation and the younger generation. And he said that he was on his way to the younger generation of that day. But before he could ever touch the younger generation, he had to take care of what was wrong with the older generation generation and it's time that we in the church come together male female young old and work together because it's going to take unity I talked about this this afternoon in our meeting if I can look out in my church all of us look the same. All of us worship the same. All of us praise the same. That's not unity. That's uniformity. God did not call us to be uniform. He called us to be unified. And it takes diversity to breed unity in the house of God. It is time for us to diversify. It's time for us to open the church doors to those who don't look like us. It's time for us to welcome those in the church who don't act like us, who don't live like us, who may use language that we would never use. Because you know what? Those are the children of God too. He died for them just like he died for every one of us that's sitting here tonight that proclaim his name. And if we don't open those doors to them, I promise you, the devil is waiting right on the outside with his doors wide open. And he don't even have to compel them to come in because we're turning them away from ours. And the only way they have to go is to him. But our lives are so full of stuff that we get so worked up that we can't we have to come to church and work through all the mully grub of our life before God can even move and I'm talking about me too y'all most of you that are here tonight know the situation that I've been walking through the last four years of my life it is not over yet but it's coming to a close very soon I'm, I'm speaking that I'm believing that there's a song that I heard a while back. It's an old Southern gospel song. And it simply says, I never lost my praise. I hate to stand before the church tonight and tell you, yeah, there were days that I lost mine. There were days that I lost hope. But one thing I never lost was my faith in God. There were days that I was mad at him. But as I told my teens this morning, he's a big boy. He can take it. He can take it. 
and he doesn't get mad when we get mad with him. And I'm going to tell you, it's one of, the, one of the biggest days that he made me the maddest. Probably was the day that I was sitting there telling him why I was mad at him. And all he simply said was, but I still love you. And as much as it wanted to make me mad, I had to re- refocus and say, you know what? You do, and I still love you. But through this journey, my life has become so full there for a while about why am I here? Why me, God? Because I didn't pull what Cadmus did in the Hunger Games, if you will. I didn't volunteer for Tribune. I didn't stand up and say, hey, I'll walk this road. Because if I had a choice, I would have told him, no, I don't think I can do that. But I can sit here and tell you today, four years later, that I've walked it. I faced it. It's been hard. But there's never been a day that he's failed me yet. And sometimes I think we need to erase that yet. Because he's never going to fail us. There's never a yet. He's not going to fail you. He hasn't to to today, and he's not going to the rest of your life. But here we have Mary. The thing about these Jewish areas that they lived in, they were very small communities. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew each other's names. Everybody knew each other's dirt. You couldn't hide that. They knew who you were. They knew where you had been. They knew your mama. They knew your grandmama. They knew your daddy. They knew your aunts, your uncles, your cousins. They knew where you fit, where you didn't belong. They knew just what you've done. No doubt they probably had shared your story multiple times over when they had no business sharing your story. Talked about you behind your back, in front of your face, all around. But she did not care at that moment. She needed to get to Jesus for whatever reason. I know Jesus says here that she had saved this for her, for her to anoint him for his burial. I don't want to focus on that tonight. I want to focus on the oil. Mary came in that night and some theologians believe that the oil that she poured on him was the oil that she had received for payment for the lifestyle at which she lived. Many believe, and it is spoken, that Mary that was, was a harlot of the day. And they would wear this little amulet on a necklace and they would fill it with that oil when the transaction was complete. That's how they paid. That's what some believe. And so no doubt she would go home and at the end of her day, she had this alabaster box that probably sat on a desk somewhere that she kept adding to it, adding to it. The Bible says that the oil was equivalent to one year's wage. In that day, that might not have been a big amount. And here it says um, it could have been sold for 300 denarii. Think of what you make in a year today. That's how much she poured on Jesus. Could you take your yearly annual salary and just throw it at the church and give it to Jesus? It wasn't about the money. But no doubt in her life, if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 18, the Bible tells us a story where Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal, the Jezebel's prophets, and he tells them to build an altar. They build the altar. He tells them to bring in a bull. They bring in the bull. They sacrifice it. They put it on the altar. And they pray all day long. They get to the point that they have not heard from their God and they begin to cut themselves and, and, and bleed on the altar there, trying to get the attention of their God. And the Bible says, finally, Elijah stands up and it's his turn. 
He's built the altar. He brings in the sacrifice. He lays it upon the altar. The Bible says he digs a trench around it and then he commands them to bring 12 barrels of water and pour it on the sacrifice. Now, what is the significance behind that was that at this time they were in the middle of a drought. No, they weren't in the middle of a drought. They'd been three years in a drought. Because just after this, we see that the rain came. But they had been in the drought. There was a famine in the land. So at that time, water was one of their most precious commodities because you couldn't just walk out to the stream and get water. There had been no rain. It had dried up. So 12 barrels of water. I mean, they must have thought in their minds at this time, who is this idiot asking us to bring out 12 barrels of water knowing that that might be the only 12 barrels that we have left? But nonetheless, they brought it. Elijah poured out the most precious thing that they had at that moment to offer God. The Bible says he prayed a 63 word prayer. God answered by fire. And because of that, we see that the children of Israel turned their hearts and their lives back to God. We see that the rains did come back. We see that the drought did end. But focusing on that most precious thing, no doubt in Mary's life right now, that was the most precious thing that she probably had, was that box of oil. But it didn't matter if that was everything she had. Pouring it out on her master was worth giving him everything she had what do you have in your life right now that is your most precious commodity that is the most precious and most valuable thing to you I'm not asking you to give it to him that's not the point of this message but what how easy is it the Bible says she walks in she kneels down at his feet and she pours out this box of alabaster on him and, and anoints his feet it's easy for us to write a check, some of us to write a check to the church and don't even miss that money when it comes out of the bank next week. But what did that really do? Yes, it helps the church, but what did it really do? It's easy for some of us to come in and lay down all of our burdens and lay down everything that we have that's just stressing us out before God and placing it on him, but what did that really do? At that moment in her life, she poured out everything she had that would help her survive for the next year till she made her wages again. But not only that, at this point, she had walked away from that lifestyle. So knowing that I don't have a job left, I don't know how I'm going to make that money back, it still did not matter to her. She poured out all she had. She poured out everything she had at that moment. But the Bible did not stop there. After pouring out everything she had, after pouring out all of her heartaches, after pouring out all of her living that she had, after pouring out everything, and at that moment you think you don't have anything else that you can pour out to God, the Bible says she poured out of herself. And on her hands and knees at the feet of her master, she began to weep. And as the tears flowed from her eyes, the Bible says she began to wash his feet with her tears. She had already given him all of her material stuff. Many of us may be walking in a lifestyle now that we've handed over that aspect of our life. But how many of us has got desperate enough that we have poured out ourselves? How many of us has got desperate enough that it doesn't matter what it's going to take? 
I may look like a fool doing this. People may tell me I'm crazy for doing that. I don't care at this moment in life. I am ready for God to move in my house. I'm ready for God to move in my family. I'm ready for God to move in my church. And so whatever it takes for me to get the attention of God, I'm willing to pour it all out at his feet. If that means giving up my job to follow after him, if that means emptying out my bank account to help the church fix whatever they have to fix or to afford the ministry even further or to to help a missionary on the mission field, whatever it may be, it's easy to do those things. It's not easy, but it is easy because we didn't really give of ourselves at that moment. We emptied ourselves of a lot of problems. We're so so easy for us to give him all of our problems because we don't want them. It's easy for me to write a check and send somebody overseas to do the work. It's easy for me to to, to write a check and, and let the church use it to do whatever to forward the ministry. And in essence, that's what she did when she poured out the alabaster box on him. She poured out of her material possessions on to Jesus. But it was not enough. She did not stop there. And it could have been enough for Jesus. But Mary said, that's not enough. I want to give my all. I've given my possessions, but now I want to give of myself. I would go as far to say the number one thing that stands in our way of allowing God to move is us. We walk in the church day after day. We pay our tithes with gladness. We pray in the altars. We we give abundantly. Like I said this afternoon, we show up. We go above. We go beyond. We have outreach. We have this. We have that. We have this. But we have gotten so busy in the church, we have forgot to pour out of ourselves. And honestly, y'all, God could care less for all the programs that we have. God could care less of the outreach that we have if he does not have us. I remember one day walking through this this troubling trial of my life. I prayed and I asked God, you've asked me to give you everything and I have. I've given you all that I know to give. Walking through this trial of life, I lost some things. And he began to deal with my heart And I didn't really want to hear what he said, like most of us. And I went to dinner that night. My mama looked at me. She says, I believe I heard the Lord tell me to share this with you. And she says, you say a lot. You've given everything. You've given everything. You've given. What more does he want from me? And I had already heard what God said. And she just solidified it. And she said, he wants your pain. He wants your hurt. He wants your rejection that you feel. He wants to take all of that and trade it for his mercy, for his grace, for his love, for his favor, for his anointing. It is time for us as a church to do just what Mary did. No doubt in our lives there are many times that we're sitting in church and we want to pour our all out to God, but we feel like the preacher's preaching at that moment. I can't do that. The altars are always open. No doubt you may be sitting in Sunday school when the Sunday school teacher is teaching and I don't think this is the appropriate time to pour out before pour it out. You might be sitting and walking through Walmart and you feel the spirit begin to to tug at you. And you don't I don't want to look like a fool and look like a fool in Walmart. You don't know who might get saved because of it. Y'all, one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen in my life is I went to Walmart one day. And one of the workers was had been diagnosed with cancer and she had been out of work for several months and she came just to visit. 
And when she walked in that door, there was a cash. I was standing in line and the cashier caught glimpse of her. And obviously God had begin had been speaking to her about this woman. And when she walked in the door, she she walked out from behind the cash register. She didn't care. She was in the middle of a transaction. She did not care. She walked out. She laid hands on that woman. And y'all, she began to pray in the spirit. And before long, both of them had just given over to what God wanted to do. And people just stood in awe and they just watched. Y'all, when we pour out, if we're in Walmart, if we're in the middle of the street, there's been times I've been riding down the, the middle of the highway and God just begins to speak to my heart and I have to stop, pull off the side of the road and just let him do what he wants to do. I'm a firm believer that one day when we stand before God, he's going to be able to show us all the blessings that we missed, that he wanted to give us, but because we just wouldn't pour out. We wouldn't let him move in us. And I believe that's going to be the only tears that's going to be shed in heaven that day is when we realize what we could have had if we would have just let him move. I don't want that to happen when we get to heaven. Y'all know the words that have been spoken in this church just as well as I do. You know the words that have come from pastor. Last week, if you were here, what the Lord had said to him, I'm getting ready to take this church and make them a mighty army. Yo, I don't know if that excites you, but it, 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 it puts me in an uproar in my spirit. Why? Because God is getting ready to move in his church like he has never moved before. But if we are so full of junk, if we are so full of strife, if we are so full of anger with the one in the pew on the other side of the church because they made me mad, if we're so full of self that we cannot hear him, we're going to watch that mighty army rise in the church while we're left out. Because y'all, the things that God is getting ready to do, he does not have time to stroke our egos. He does not time to have a pep rally in the church to get us expecting again. He does not have time to talk us into serving him. God is not coming back for a limp-wristed bride. He's coming back for one that is spotless, that is blameless, and that is ready to fight alongside of him. And if this world needs any more churches to pour out today than they ever have, today is the day. There is such stupidity that is growing rampant every day. Something new comes out. Some new idiocracy comes, comes out. And I heard a preacher say this week, and he said, don't you dare point your finger at the White House before you pointed at the church house because we have been quiet too long we have held our tongues with fear of of offending some we've held our tongues with fear of of what the government may be able to do to our church but y'all, I believe our church has made a decision and I believe I can stand here and speak for all of us that we're going to speak the truth no matter what we lose. If they lock us up and throw us in prison and throw away the keys, we'll just do like Paul and Silas. We'll pray to them doors pop open. If he did it then, he can do it again. But y'all tonight, I want them to go back to that song for just a minute. I want us to come around this altar tonight. I want us to make this our prayer. And just like the song they sang prior to this, I just want to move your heart. Tell me whatever it is that moves you and that will I do. 
And I'm here to tell you the one thing that moves God the most is when his people will turn their eyes and their hearts to him. They will empty out of themselves and allow him to pour his spirit into them. I don't think there is nothing that would move God any greater than for a church to come together, pour it all out, and let him fill us up again. Let his spirit fill us up again. Tonight as they sing, I want all of us to just join together in the altars. And I want us to let God move. Just like it says, I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. So come tonight and let's make this our prayer, guys.
Some things are just going to have to go. And we can put a value on it. But I sit here and say, God, if you haven't valued it, I don't want to value it. Because, see, self and the flesh can hold on to things. You've heard me tell the story. My wife, with Isaac coming up, held everything. We had big toes, not really is a lot it could be a crown mark and she's like we got to save that until it become a bit much it can be overwhelming when you look at a stockpile of things and just wonder but I don't know what to get rid of I don't want to be like they were on the boat with Jonah and just throwing things aimlessly overboard things that they needed to survive and so I just pray God if it's not beneficial for me spiritually or you haven't assigned it to be in my life I want you to help me release it so that there's room for you so Father we thank you what a great reminder you created us the very breath that we breathe started from you and everything has been orchestrated by the, the cycle of life for one to give to another. And spiritually, we stand before you in the same manner. There are things that you want to give us. Things that we want to give you. And what you have in store for us are things for our spiritual survival. The continuation of our spiritual life. And so, Father, what we want to give back to you are the things that drain that. The things that absorb what you are trying to give us and allow you the full control after all you know us better than anybody and so here we stand 
still believing, still trusting you through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. So the mighty army, as you begin to bring flesh to our bones, as you begin to bring the ligaments and the necessities of life, and still yet we can stand and appear to be an army, but until you breathe, until you breathe. And so God, would you give us a fresh breath? fresh breath that we might be pleasing in your sight. Now, Father, as we go our separate ways, I pray that you would touch us. pray that you would move. Would you bless men as we come tomorrow for the men's ministry. Help us build strong relationships that there are shoulders that we can lean on. Would you help us Wednesday as we study again into the book of Revelation. Help us on Friday, God, as we come in worship. And Sunday as we come again and then go out of the walls of this church to do ministry, to love on your creation, to show them that your way is better. Give us strength. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Love you. Have a great week in the Lord.